The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, so this is going to be more an introductory, what's Puppet all about, what can you do sort of talk. Uh, tomorrow I'm giving a new advanced talk, so we're going to dive into like M Collective here. Uh, I'm going to show a lot of code. Uh, and then the other route, Sunday, I'm doing a tutorial. Uh, so it's going to be an all-day uh, tutorial. And so if you've uh, been using Puppet and want to know what's going on, come to my talk tomorrow. If you want to learn more, come to the tutorial Sunday. Um, right on. Cool. So uh, give a, a brief background about myself. Uh, uh, my background is mostly in systems engineering. Uh, I started using Puppet uh, late 2007. Uh, I was deploying a uh, nationwide uh, carrier grade VoIP system, and uh, that included a lot of kit in different cities uh, with pre uh, structured pre-production uh, pre environments. And uh, before we were you know, doing things by hand, scripts, stuff like that, uh, and I knew there was just no way we were going to be able to deploy the system and have the reliability that you need for a phone system without automating it. Uh, so I looked at some tools. I started using Puppet. Uh, within 30 minutes, I had it like doing things. And off I went. Uh, fast forward, and I started working there a year and a half ago. Um, for folks that aren't using configuration management, uh, have you gotten any uh, like pushback or uh, folks that are like when you when you started implementing it for maybe your uh, your peers your managers? You just said we're going to roll with Puppet and everything worked. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's a common one. It takes longer the first time, so why, uh, why put more into it? Um, so I uh, don't believe that uh, your systems are these unique snowflakes that need to be handcrafted uh, in some artisanal way. Um, uh, the first one I hear, uh, uh, besides the, uh, the time thing, is that systems are only temporary. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we all know damn well, if you put a system out there and someone starts using it, you can't just take it back the next day. People are going to rely on it. Um, uh, replicas. So uh, I saw this uh, great uh, poster at a TV station recently. I had the Dosakis guy, and it's saying, uh, I don't test often, but when I do, I do it in production. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so hopefully, like you don't roll like that, and uh, you want you know this idea of like a dev, a QA, staging, etc. Like you have some environments where you actually test things before they go to production, right? Uh, so, how many people have had the experience where they go and they test something and it works? It goes through QA and it works, and it gets to production and it blows up, and you're working all night. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And what's it turn out to be? Inconsistencies between where you're testing and, and production, right? So you, you see that you know, versions of software are slightly different. Uh, that caused an issue. Maybe it worked in dev and QA because somebody just put in the sim link that was obvious so that the thing like would work, but that wasn't captured. And so when you went to deploy it, it blew up, right? Um, Disaster recovery, like does anyone think about when their systems are going to blow up or AWS is going to go offline again, like things like this? Yeah. And so when you get used to provisioning your systems and so the thought of, oh, what if that system goes down, you're not really worried about that. Um, I, think, I think this is often overlooked. I remember working at a, uh, uh, a large assembly plant and there was a machine that ran the plant. 
And uh, they said, if this machine ever goes down, you know, drop everything and go there. I'm like, and then what? And they're like, well, you know, hope it's not you on the shift, right? Because uh, no one knew how it actually worked. Uh, so their, their, their idea of DR was totally like non-existent. You definitely don't want to be there, right? Um, you really do get into this practice, though, using uh, Puppet and config management of you have an issue with a system, we'll just blow it away, recreate it, build it up from scratch, and it's going to come back every time. And once, once you start to get that trust, uh, things like DR are easy because you're, you're doing this stuff every day. Like, like, you don't have to have these systems that are, you know, ancient and you hope that they just never go down, right? Um, so why we're all here today, uh, cloud, so I can spin up tons of boxes. Uh, who manages their VM's cloudy infrastructure now with images? It's okay. I'm not going to laugh. Somebody does. Um, and so what happens like when you do that? Uh, you get image sprawl, and so you have this, uh, like the snapshot, you make a change, I'll just snap it again, make a change, snap it again, and then you don't really know what's going on there, because like the history keeps building up, so like cruft keeps like building up. Uh, if you're doing this with multiple systems, you end up with these like matrices of, well, if I have this snapshot at this version, it'll work with this one at this one, and it's, it's really hard to understand what's going on. Also, uh, you want to be able to build your systems across multiple platforms. And so you can use different uh, cloudy solutions, physical solutions, uh, you know, things like Vagrant on your laptop, because you know they're all being provisioned and built the same way, uh, which gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, who, who here has ever built a cluster by hand? A anyone? And so. What, like what happens uh, at first? You build it, everything's shiny and new, they all look the same, maybe you got your load balancer in front, everything's cool, and then like a week goes by and they're probably still mostly cool, and then a month, six months, a year. And what happens is uh, the, the entropy grows on these systems, like the cruft like builds up, and suddenly they're not really the same, and your script in a for loop uh, doesn't always work, and you start seeing systems take on characteristics of their own. Uh, like, you know, why is that one mail server, its queue always longer? Why is that one web server, why is it always slower to like to respond, et cetera? Um, so, uh, like change management. Um, how many folks now, when they want to go change something, they just, uh, you know, SSH into a box and do some work? Yeah? And so that makes it really hard if you're working on a team to really know what's going on. Uh, so how often do you have this conversation at work with your teammates? Hey, when was the last time you were on? Uh, what, did you change anything on this box? All right? Well, no, kind of. You know, I just poked around a little bit. I don't know, right? Um, oh. Like how many folks document what they do on a wiki? Yeah? And so who's ever documented building a system on a wiki before? Yeah? So that, that there's like some useful stuff there, like maybe you put some links where you got the software, your thoughts behind it, like the commands. But then you go back to that wiki a month later, could you really rebuild that machine? A year later? Probably not. Uh, usually I would look at wiki pages when I start at a company just to get like a broad overview of what folks are doing but all the technical information is just trash. Um, for change management, a lot of that's really done with Puppet uh, through the version control system. And so we don't enforce a uh, VCS, uh, but we encourage you to use one. And so that version control system can help you with the change management in terms of knowing uh, you know, who changed what, when, et cetera. Um, like how many people in their commit messages write updated this, changed this from X to Y, right? Like we've all written commit messages like that. Yeah, those commit messages are useless. Uh, Diff does a really good job of telling us what changed. I'm just hoping people get from my talk to put why they changed things or like what it accomplishes. Um, 
I know I'm really bad about doing that, so. Um, this idea of, of infrastructure as code, and so after I started like, by using Puppet for a while, uh, what happened was anytime we SSH to a system, it became indicative of a failure scenario. Uh, and generally I couldn't SSH at that point, I was doing like console access. Uh, and so really the need for SSH, I mean the protocol itself and everything is fine, but how you administer systems, you're not directly connecting one to one. And if, if you're already building systems in the cloud and thinking programmatically, this idea of a single machine starts to become really antiquated. Uh, or even knowing like what your machines are called starts to become antiquated. Um, good thing of treating your infrastructure as code is you have revision history. So that there's no more asking, hey, who changed what, when, what's going on? You can just look at the log. Um, if you wanna know what changed in your infrastructure, you can use those simple tools like diff uh, to see what changed. Uh, you can start to leverage things like continuous integration with Jenkins to actually test your infrastructure so uh, your, like your changes are well tested and automated ahead of time. Uh, so we're not up at 3 a.m. Uh, when we should be out. Cool. Uh, Puppet, uh, we have a big community <coughs> ecosystem. Obviously, uh, I'm with the company behind it, but it's very much a very open uh, source-like company. Uh, I use the same tools that you would. Uh, we have a ton of people on IRC at any one point in time, so that's a great place to go to get help. Uh, there's also a, a mailing list with lots of folks on it. Uh, Puppet's pervasive. This is the obligatory sales slide I let them put in here, uh, which is another way of saying that you're not the beta user. Uh, that was us back in 2007, 2008. Uh, lots of folks are using us now. Um, I just heard, oh, and I'm gonna slaughter the name, that the, uh, uh, the private space company in LA that's putting the rockets up, yeah, yeah, that they're using us, uh, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, Puppet Enterprise, so, Open source company, we have an enterprise like product. Um, you're basically like getting support and then we're building features on top of the open source that are enterprisey in nature. Uh, so lots of UI stuff for clicking and reporting, that kind of thing. Uh, we are committed to keeping our core functionality open source and then building these uh, sort of tools that use that uh, and making those enterprise and pay for um, is the plan. Uh, when you run the enterprise version, and I promise this isn't gonna be like a sales speech, we're gonna move on past this slide, is that uh, we encapsulate our software. So we, we, we vendor our own versions of Ruby, Apache, OpenSSL, et cetera, and that way our versions don't conflict with your versions. Um, I've personally like run into those problems where uh, I was managing a site that was running like Mod Perl, but then I was also using these Perl based tools to manage the system. And so the whole reason why we're there is the website, but its version needed one that conflicted with my tools and that was a big headache. So we get past that. Um, like dig into how Puppet works. And so Puppet works first by defining um, what you want your systems to look like. And we do that in our own DSL. Uh, it's Puppet domain specific language that's really built and tailored to describing aspects of the system um, as opposed to just a, just a broad like language. Um, you, you can then take this code that you've written and simulate it against your nodes. Uh, so that allows you to run basically in, in a no-op mode so you could actually see what would happen uh, this, is, this is great uh, for, you know, before you do some maintenance event or wanna make some change. Uh, you've already tested it out, you can see what's going on, you can show that to, to folks. Uh, this has really helped me out and not getting called in. Um, then you can run Puppet in the regular enforcing mode, and there it's gonna take uh, the code that you've written that says the machine should look like this, and it's gonna diff it against reality and make any changes as necessary. And then anytime we make a change or we run in simulate mode, uh, reports get kicked off 
we'll dive more into each of these. Um, yeah. Yep, so you can either run it in just the regular mode. Uh, so the question was, uh, can you enforce the simulation? The, the no-op Yes, and so uh, you can either run in like a no-op mode, which like simulates, or you can just run in the normal mode, which would make changes on the system. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, like, the uh, New York Stock Exchange, uh, they don't make any changes at all, like, while the trading floor is open. Like, nobody's supposed to touch things. Uh, but obviously, you know, things happen and some changes have to be made. And so, after the, the bell rings, uh, they run in no op mode. And so, that generates reports and they can see if anything did change. And then they have a change approval board that you know figures out why those changes were made, approves them or not, and if so, those changes get put into Puppet, and then they can run in the actual enforcing mode during a maintenance window in the evening, and then be ready the next day. Um, what's that? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get there in just a minute, and then we can go on. So. Uh, uh, the code that you write is uh, comprised of these different modules. So you can write modules, you can get modules from our forge, uh, forge.puppetlabs.com. Um, and so you would write modules for like MySQL, Apache, like Java, you know, different security things. You're probably gonna have tons of modules to manage different aspects of your system from sudo to NTP to your resolver, et cetera. And then you have to have this node to code relationship so I built all these small distinct modules, and then I associate them with different types of systems. Uh, and so in that way, I'm really building out the role of the system. So you know, all systems might have you know, these different security modules, you know, sort of base modules that are common to all of our systems, like I need like monitoring, kernel tuning, NTP, et cetera. And then you start building up the app stack, and so then for your web servers, you start including your Apache-like module, et cetera, and build those up. And now I have a role defined, and I can just assign that role to a system, and that system's gonna take on that role. Yeah. So uh, how we like do this, uh, I'll talk in terms of best practices with any config management, is we have this uh, blank hardware lack of a VM, uh, and then this provisioning process uh, that creates a base install. That base install should be uh, the smallest install of what it means to be a node on your network. Um, like how many folks are using something like uh, Kickstart or, or like something now, yeah. And so you wouldn't want different Kickstarts for like your database system versus your web system or something. You want just one common small installation and then all that configuration to be done with Puppet. Um, like how many folks now get their base install and then they run, you know, like a series of uh, scripts uh, and then that turns it into a node? Or a lot of folks at that point, like maybe uh, the first thing you do, you provision a box in EC2, you pull down some tarball and you run some script against it and then a system happens. That's pretty common. Um, what Puppet is going to do is, not, is, besides building it into the assigned role, is it's going to maintain it and ensure that state. And so uh, most of the scripts that I've written uh, to do this like sort of thing, they just built out systems. And if you ran them twice, they probably broke the system. Um, and they surely didn't main, maintain it. They just got it to that point. Whereas Puppet's going to keep like, running and ensuring that system's just the way it was like when it was built. Um, like any questions here? Okay. So we talk about state a lot. Um, 
These are kind of academic looking slides, but like desired state could be something as simple as I want Etsy pseudoers to be owner group mode root root 0400, and I want it to have a specific content, right, of what I want in the pseudoers file. Uh, you're, you're obviously going to be managing more than just one file, but that's just uh, one thing. So if, if any part of that drifts uh, out, uh, when Puppet runs, it's going to converge just the part that changed. So if just the contents of the file changed, we're going to fix that. If maybe just the uh, mode, somebody changed the mode on it, it would just see that one piece. And if the state was already where you wanted it, then Puppet wouldn't need to take any actions on the file resource because it would already be where you want it to be. And that way, Puppet's item potent. Uh, so it means it's safe to run multiple times, uh, unlike most of the bash scripts that I wrote. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk a bit about data flow with uh, Puppet. Uh, so we have a node uh, that starts off, and uh, like generally Puppet's run in a uh, uh, pull-based configuration, and so by default, your nodes will wake up every 30 minutes uh, and check in with the master and see if there's anything new for it. That's all configurable, and you can even run in a centralized push-like mechanism where you have the puppet master basically go out and kick all the nodes and say, you know, update right now. So that functionality is there as well. So the nodes start off, and they send a bunch of information we call facts. Uh, about themselves to the puppet master. The puppet master then uh, goes and, and sees, oh, well, you're this node. Uh, what code do I have associated like with you? So what's your role? Were you the web server? Were you the database server, et cetera? And what it does is it compiles a catalog, which we can think of of all the resources we care about to make that system. So like we don't have to describe every aspect of the systems just the parts that we care about that we want to manage. Uh, so that catalog is sent back to the node, and then the node can interpret it uh, and figure out what it wants to do, what needs to change, et cetera. And again, anytime there might be a change or a puppet run, a, a report gets like kicked out. Cool. So facts, uh, you provide asset inventory as well. And they're just uh, key value pairs. And so this is just a short list of facts. Uh, and then we see we have the values. So each of these are available uh, within the Puppet language as top scoped variables, uh, which lets us do two things, uh, uh, templates. So imagine you have a bunch of web servers, and the only thing that's different is maybe your uh, uh, listen uh, IP, so like where it's like listening. So you could have a file for each of your systems, or you could just like templatize it and put in, you know, dollar sign IP address, and it would listen on that, right? Um, besides doing templates, you can also do conditional logic. And so I might have logic in my code that says, you know, if you're on a Mac, then do this sort of thing. Or if you're on CentOS versus Ubuntu, you know, you need to do these sorts of things. Um, uh, or I might look at uh, total memory in the system, and then based on that total memory, I might use a template to uh, see how much RAM I need to give to like Java for the uh, heap size or something. But now I can start doing all this uh, within the code, and I don't have to think, oh, well, that class of systems, we put that much RAM in, so I need to know that and think about it. and and sort of code these like one-offs for these different sets. I can just start accessing things programmatically. Um, cool. Like, how many folks in here code in Ruby? So I got uh, a few a few hands. Um, even if you don't, uh, puppets not while well, puppets written in Ruby, you don't need to know Ruby to use it. Um, just like you don't need to know C to use a Linux box. Uh, so we do have custom facts, and if you know Ruby, then this looks probably like pretty easy. For everyone else, the part that matters is we have some fact called role, and it's going to exec whatever's in there. And so uh, it makes it really easy to write custom facts. If you can write a shell script, 
you can have a custom fact, or you could write it in a language that you know like better, and you could have it trigger that as well. Uh, I think the first custom fact that I wrote was uh, uh, I had some vendor supplied binary for my rate arrays, and it gave me this huge multi-line output, and the only part I cared about was, you know, is my array okay or failed or degraded? And I could just do some quick uh, grep awk like magic and get out that one field. Now I have a custom fact, and I can query all my systems and get that information. Um, where, where folks might use custom facts um, or in things like EC2, et cetera, is to read metadata about that system. Uh, and then you might even inject that at boot time. So when you create uh, a new node, you might inject different bits of information like role, et cetera, you know, what the box is, does, and then we could query those through custom facts. Um, so the catalog, um, it's a comprehensive resource list of all the bits that we care about on the system, right? Um, so there's lots of things on your boxes you just kind of expect to work and you don't mess with. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list where we expect you're gonna describe every single file in dev and every service and process. This is just the things you care about. Um, reporting. Uh, we have different report handlers, so HTTP, HTTPS uh, for sending reports off via the, that like, mechanism. Log is just like syslog, so it makes it easy to set up log. You can set, set up like centralized syslog and use a tool like log stash or Splunk to look through things. Uh, store lets you store the report data uh, as a YAML file. Uh, that way you can write your own report processor and use that data as opposed to trying to uh, you know, use like syslog and trying to get unstructured data and do, doing something with it. You could actually just get structured like data. Uh, ta like tag mail uh, is something cool in that you can tag different bits of the code and whenever something would change on a system, an email would go out. So maybe your DBAs, you know, they don't care about anything else except you know, what's going on with MySQL. So you could say, well, if anything related to MySQL changes on a system, let's email the DBA so they know something happened. Um, you could also use this to uh, fire off an email that would be the input for a ticketing system. And so you could use this to automatically create tickets for you. Uh, maybe your uh, security team um, has different uh, like policies in place, and so they want to know if, some, if like sudoers has changed or PAM or SSHD or something. So that could create an incident in their like ticketing system. No. Um, besides these report handlers, uh, there's other report handlers on our website you could uh, download and install. Uh, I've seen them for IRC, uh, Jabber, um, Twitter, all sort of things. And so you, you can get this reporting data to wherever you want it. Um, Here's a graphic of our, our enterprise console, and so it just shows uh, the different systems there, and then you could like drill down and uh, grab reports from a web interface as well. Um, this just goes into uh, the actual flow, uh, for folks that are curious about that, and so I'll just run through this quickly of what's actually going on between uh, the agent and a master. And so the node makes initial contact uh, with the master. Uh, it checks in. Again, all of the communication is done over SSL. Um, so we use that for transport as well as the search for authentication. Uh, the master is going to sync any custom facts and plugins to the node, um, which is then going to send its facts back to the master and then ask for a catalog so that that resource list. Um, it's going to send that catalog back to the agent, which then is going to apply the catalog. The master at this point also acts as a file server, so we can request files and receive those. And then when it's done, the agent's going to kick that report off to the master, who then uh, has the different report handlers enabled. So it's then going to put it on, you know, syslog, IRC, et cetera. Um, 
from looking at this, you can see like there's not a whole lot going on on the node itself, and the master is really just doing compilation. And so uh, the Puppet Master is very much a uh, CPU bound uh, type, type workload. This is uh, what, what really got me interested in Puppet, is that we get to talk about the what and not the how. Uh, so notice here I'm saying package, NTP, and sure installed. So I've got a resource, which is some abstraction. Notice I'm not saying use apt or yum or package add or something. I'm just saying there's some abstraction called a package, like we all know what that is. It's got a name, and I want to ensure that it's there. Um, I really like this approach, especially from uh, administering different types of Linux and Unix systems, or I guess we even have Windows support now, uh, is that I, I, I don't have to remember, you know, is it apt or yum, or is it add user or user add, and what are the different arguments and flags, like, that's not really the interesting part of building systems. Um, so I can use these abstractions. Um, so this is what you, this is the code you would write. This would be on the master. It would turn this into a catalog. So basically put this in like YAML format and send it off. Uh, and then the agent itself has these different providers. And so the agent just gets a copy of this and then it says, oh, I'm a, I'm a CentOS box, so I'm gonna use YAML. Or I'm a, uh, 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 OS X box, so I'm gonna use Darwin port or something, right? And so it decides how it's gonna interpret those. Um, and that way the, the master doesn't really need to know what type of system it is, et cetera. Um, so we have a ton of different resource types, and this is just a short list. So we have things on here besides package like files, uh, services, mounts, cron, exec to run commands, uh, ZFS, SSH key, et cetera. So different aspects of your system uh, we, can, we can abstract out. Um, yeah. Post entries, user entries, et cetera. Um, here's some uh, actual code. And so this is our uh, very common design pattern called package file service. And so uh, like generally like when you're setting up services, you install a package or a list of packages, right? And then you go and you modify a few config files and provided you did that correctly, uh, a service starts at the end, right? Whether it's Apache, MySQL, NTP, it all sort of works like this. Uh, and so I'll go through what this looks like. So we have our package file and our service. We have the file has a source, and so it's actually just, uh, the agents would just pull that file over the network. Uh, and the file requires the package. Um, and here we have the service. We want to ensure that it's running and that enable is true, which says that it says start at boot time. And then we see the service is subscribed to the file. And so Puppet's uh, a declarative language. We're not really top down in the ordering. And so we have to connect these different resources together. So obviously in this scenario, it needs to be in the order of package then file, then service, right? We can't start the service if we haven't installed the package. Uh, so to track those relationships, we use a graph. And so we use a directed acyclical graph uh, to map out all these <coughs> entries. Um, so what this would do is ensure order between the three, and the subscribe line would, would uh, like tell us if the file ever changed that we need to restart the service. So that way you could uh, uh, you know, update your NTP conf and your version control, uh, a new one gets pushed out, and then it knows, hey, I gotta restart the service to take control of that. Um, any questions on package file service? Yeah. Yeah, so you could, you could specify those. Uh, so the question was, uh, so, so, so some demons don't want to be restarted, they want to accept like signals, and we can specify those. Um, cool. We also support file serving, and so uh, here's what that would look like. You have a puppet URI, 
uh, the name of the module, and then the file you want to serve up, so we can serve things that way. We can also do templates, and so, uh, again, here was, here's just a message of the day file, so you log in and you would see this, and so it's going to uh, change these and put in these facts from factor. Uh, so you can imagine using uh, templates, you know, and your different config files, like wherever you have like data, you know. Uh, like another example might be your resolve conf. Uh, your resolve conf is just a bunch of data, like what name servers do you connect to, things like that. And so I could specify those as an array and then have uh, the system create my name servers appropriately. Because maybe I use different ones in different locations, et cetera. Uh, this is just a bit more advanced than that here. We're doing a for loop, like basically. And so here we have a name servers as an array. And for every element in the array, it's going to print a line that's name server and then the element of the array. So this is so that you can do a bit more advanced things in the templates. That's your question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what if your files are different enough that the template doesn't quite make sense? I'd say that you, you probably could template it with some conditionals based inside of the template. That might help for that. Um, another thing to do might be maybe you just have a few classes of config files, and so maybe you just choose the right template file, and then you've at least gone from thousands to you know a handful, and then maybe you could use conditionals to get it down to one depending on how much time you need to invest in that. Well, it's just, uh, it's, it's not beyond capabilities or, or anything like that. It's just bad in terms of your time. And so if you can templatize it, then you don't have to remember to update all these files. And it's going to give you better consistency to your, uh, like to your systems and save you time. Um, Puppet, you can do syntax uh, by checking. So you can use puppet parser validate and validate uh, the syntax. Uh, I recommend putting this in a pre-commit hook. It's really easy to write bad code, um, but let's not even accept it into version control if it's not going to parse. And so you can set up a pre-commit hook and do this. Um, there's also uh, puppet lint. And so I would check that out. Puppet lint uh, ensures that the code complies with our style guide. Um, I'll plug the style guide here. So the style guide is more than just use two space tabs and no literal tabs and that sort of thing, which is important, uh, especially when you're coding with a team that everybody's using that same layout. But the style guide goes more and it talks a lot about best practices and how to do things in your code. And so uh, recommend folks check that out. Uh, we're turning the style guide to get it uh, versioned, and so that way y you could say, you know, uh, we conform to version 1.2 of the puppet style guide, and then each of the sections are versioned as well. So you could say we can conform to version 1.2 except for section 4.3.2 because we think they're crazy, and we do it this way, right? But then at least the people on your team all know sort of what's expected, what the code should look like, what practices you're following. Um, getting toward the end here, uh, store configs is a functionality that we have that allows you to pass data between nodes without the nodes knowing about each other. And so to do that, it uses the database as a proxy to store that information. Yeah? Uh, no, just any agents. Uh, the question was just uh, puppet masters and, uh, um, and so, how this might look is every node could export, say, its own SSH key. And so we're all exporting our own. And then all of the nodes can be importing all of the SSH keys that have been exported. So if you did that on each of your systems, they would each send theirs out, and then they would each pull all of them in. And so you'd have an up-to-date uh, list of like uh, host keys for all your systems. 
So now when you SSH, you don't have to type yes a bunch when you get, like, go to the new server, right? Like they're already there. Um, you could also use this, um, let's say with, uh, you're running like HA proxy or something, and so you, you wanna list out nodes that you should be proxying to. So just systems that should be in that, in that like load balancer group, you could export, hey, I should be there, and then the, the system that's acting as the, the proxy service could just collect that list of nodes. Uh, another use for this might be with like uh, Bacula or some other backup uh, like system. Um, is so you know the backup server knows the systems that are supposed to connect to it and you don't have to hard code those, it just collects them from the network. Um, one last thing is uh, external node classifier. So Puppet uses our dashboard as an ENC or external node classifier. Node classification is just uh, another way of saying uh, what role do my systems have? Are they web servers, are they databases, et cetera? And so it's a way to make that mapping. So you could use uh, our text files, you could use our dashboard, or you could write your own. Uh, it's wherever you want that source of truth to be of what your systems are. Like, does anyone already have like a source of truth of you know what systems are on their network and what they're supposed to do? Yeah. And so instead of uh, trying to duplicate that data, we could just query it directly. Um, yeah. So, on that note, uh, we'll open it up for Q and A. And I think some uh, T-shirts just showed up is what I'm hearing back there. So maybe we'll bring those up. Yeah, right on. So uh, we'll sort of some questions, yeah. How many hosts can you manage with a single puppet master? So the question is how many hosts can you manage with a single puppet master? And that is totally dependent on the hardware that you have. Uh, so do you have a micro instance of EC2 or do you have like a 96 core system? I don't know. So, uh, like, generally we see that like eight core systems, um, 16 gigs of RAM, a system like that uh, would, would probably do like 2,500 nodes. Uh, it just depends a lot on how big your catalog is, how many resources you're doing, are you managing things recursively? There's like a lot that goes into how that works, how often your systems check in, et cetera. Uh, I'm not qu quite aware of that, but I know we have people like using Puppet with you know greater than tens of thousands of nodes, uh, so I, I can't see that as an issue. No, you, you wouldn't want to run on a single server regardless because you care about reliability, hopefully, and so you're going to expect it to fail, and so I would load balance the service. So what's the difference between Chef and Puppet? Uh, they're both configuration management tools. Uh, uh, they, they both functionally do this, the, like the same thing as the, the end goal, uh, but it's, it's in how you get there. Uh, much like uh, uh, your Ferrari and Toyota both get you across town, uh, it depends how you wanna spend your time. Um, obviously the one that employs me, come on. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, uh, a, a, another technical difference, uh, which comes down to philosophy, is the use of the graph. And so Puppet's very much uh, about using this, this graph to understand what the relationships are between different parts of your environment. Uh, whereas Chef, uh, when Adam wrote that, he wanted to get away from the graph because he thought it was too complex. And so th th there is that uh, difference of philosophy there. Uh, we think it's of course superior because we're able to leverage that information and use it elsewhere, which is why people are building uh, businesses and things on top of like Puppet. Also like point out we have, I think medium and large t-shirts uh, and then I th hopefully later on in the weekend I'm getting a shipment of other sizes so if we didn't get your size there should be more. Right on. 
Yep. Great. Uh, yep. Well, like any other? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question was, do we support open and free like BSDs? Like, good to see you again here this year. Uh, and yeah, we support B, uh, like BSDs, HPOX, AIX, uh, Windows, Solaris, its derivatives, Linux. The second part was, uh, do you support, I saw that you supported ZFS, do you support cluster FS? Like, so could I actually set up my ZFS and set up cluster FS on top of that? Uh, so we. So we natively support ZFS. We don't have like native resource types for Gluster, uh, which isn't to say that you couldn't like use it and model it. We just don't have native types for it. So y you could use other things around it like file resource and service, et, et cetera. Or you could write a type and provider to manage it like natively. Um, and the types and providers uh, aren't too hard actually. Uh, I don't know any Ruby and I, totally extended our ZFS type and provider, and I, I know nothing about like Ruby, and I was able to build this thing, so uh, it's totally easy to hack on. Yep. Sure, so, so the question was best practices for backing up configuration files. Uh, for that, I would look at using version control. Uh, so use a version control system, back it up, et cetera. Right, and for those, we'd want to use a version control system. Yeah. Have any other questions? Yep. Uh, so the question was, can you use Windows Agent with open source version? And yes, you can. We've had that out for a while. So what do you get from going from open source to enterprise? Like probably most importantly for people that do it is support. Uh, there's somebody to call or email and talk to uh, to hold your hand, that sort of thing. Uh, besides support, on a more technical level, you get encapsulation of like Puppet. So we build it out. We put everything in opt Puppet. We vendor our own packages. That way our stuff doesn't conflict with yours. Uh, and then we also offer some other tools. Uh, so in the enterprise version, we offer uh, provisioning directly in VMware. Uh, we also offer some different UI stuff around compliance uh, for folks that are ha uh, have the opportunity to deal with uh, fun compliance stuff. Yeah, and that's really where the product uh, roadmap's going in the future as uh, we build. M we have uh, a t uh, multiple teams dedicated to just open source like Puppet, and then other ones that are building more UI enterprise -y features that would be in the enterprise version. Like, any more questions? Right on. Well, uh, I appreciate everyone for having me out. Uh, feel free to grab t-shirts. Uh, I'm going from Charlotte to Thailand, so I'm not taking them with me. So uh, please take some. Uh, right on. Thank you. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. 
this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere.
there's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.